Hello, welcome to the fine edition of my so-called 8-Bit Life. I'm your host, Roberto Vegas. Joining me today, remote from wherever the heck he's remote at, Kadesh Flow, better known as Ryan. I forget your last name, Ryan. I feel terrible about that. Oh, it's good. Davis. Right. So I thought, what's funny is I thought Ryan Davis, and I'm like, no, it can't be Ryan Davis. My brain can't remember Ryan Davis. Surely my <laughs> brain is not right. So uh, that's doubting me. That is doubting me. But I think people will be better as Kadesh Flow anyways, as the awesome nerdcore hip-hop artist uh, from the NPC Collective, as we like to call it these days. I don't even know why I said it like that. How's it going, sir? Oh, it's going great. I uh, actually just got off the stage playing with a band I play with here in Kansas City called the Fantastics at the Royals versus Rockies game at Kauffman Stadium. Oh, so, wow. God, pretty, I... pretty solid gig. <laughs> I didn't realize you played at like stadiums and stuff like that. Like I'm, I'm so used to seeing you in 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 sort of a like bar situations and, and stuff like that that I never I, I didn't realize that you actually like do you typically travel with a band outside of like when you go on tour, so to speak? Well, the bands I play with locally don't um, travel a lot, but they're really big, like locally and regionally. So we have um, gigs where we'll play for a few thousand people, and then we have, and then we do, you know, some bar gigs. We do a lot of festivals. Like we opened for George Clinton and P Funk at a beer festival. Oh here a God! Month don't, ago. don't, don't, uh, don't, don't, so- don't say. That you are oh do, do, don't don't casually just drop that Ryan oh yeah I opened I opened up for one of like the biggest funk people on the planet opened up for George Clinton no no big fucking deal like do, no no you can't just drop that just like oh yeah that's that's my life I I'm 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 sorry <laughs> I'm yeah man just the idea um, of like like fucking like I guess I gotta ask how was that opening up for George Clinton. I mean, especially oh, dude, as, as, a, as a musician and as like a, an actual like like a person that knowing what musical background you have. And we'll learn more about that today. Uh, but just knowing the instruments you play, like how was it like being in in the presence of, of you know, one of the legends of music? Um, it was awesome, man. Uh, like, it's crazy that that guy is like 80 and he still can go the way he goes. Um, but we had the. We, we had like the local stage, which is like across the um, it was like across the way from the main stage, but they they gapped it out. So it was like so it was staggered. So it was uh, it would be like a big main stage act and then a local act. But the last few acts on the main stage were big. And then the last few acts on the local stage were regionally big. So um, there were huge crowds for both. But the main MC, the MC for the main stage um, was like, hey, George Clinton's going to be up in an hour, but you should check out the Fantastics while you're waiting. And this whole crowd like migrated in front of us. And it was like just ridiculous. It was just like this sea of people. Oh, man. Um, and we, we went pretty hard, man. It was cool. Uh, but that's I mean, that happens. Kansas City is really interesting right now because it's probably like Austin was maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And they've actually hired people from Austin who were in Austin when Austin was growing. And those people are in leadership at Kansas City in various positions for creative development here. So, like, there's a lot happening with the scene where, like, you know, we'll get, I mean, I've been on, I've shared the stage with a lot of people who are really moving or already legends or what have you. And um, it just kind of happens that way. But a lot of the time, locally, I don't do a lot of solo hip hop shows. I try to make those special. So um, I play trombone with a lot of people, though, uh, with a few other rappers and then with a couple bands, a couple singer songwriters, um, to the point where I had to leave my job, my full time job, about nine months earlier than I expected to because I just hit a wall and I didn't have the time to do. I was working in financial tech. It just, the time just wasn't there anymore. So we should probably go back. Before we keep going forward, because we're going forward in time, we should probably flash back a bit. We need to kind of build up, as they say, sort of things. And I guess I got to ask, because especially because I started thinking, like, you know, how I got introduced to you in terms of just, you know, music and whatnot and being part of the nerdcore scene. And then learning, like, oh, yeah, he also plays trombone. I go, well, that's kind of crazy. It's interesting to see a hip-hop artist also play an instrument. Typically, that's – I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but that's sometimes mutually <laughs> exclusive kind of things. Um I guess I got to ask, what was your first kind of exposure to music in general? Like, how did you get into doing music, specifically like trombone? Because how long have you been playing trombone for? 
Uh, ooh, 17 years. Okay, yeah. Then and, and I'm I'm curious how the heck you got into like music, not just in in terms of the the art form, but especially performance. Just because those sometimes those things are not mutually they're 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 kind of together, but a lot of times one leads into the other. And I'm always kind of curious how an artist gets there. Yeah. Um, so for me, my first exposure to music was a couple of things. It was a mixture of like gospel and hip hop. I, what my dad would bump like Tupac and stuff when he was, he had this Mitsubishi Eclipse that had a mad crazy system in there. And he would bump all this West Coast hip hop when my parents were stationed in Cali. So I was listening to all like the death row stuff and blah, blah, blah. But then like on my mom's side of the family, cause they're, they ended up getting divorced when I was relatively young. I was pretty young. So in Alabama, it was like choir and like church choir and stuff. Um, so I've listened to a lot of gospel artists and if you, and there's like, there's like contemporary Christian music. That's very simple from a chordal standpoint, but like gospel artists like Fred Hammond or Marvin Sapp or what have you, those guys are ridiculously good musically and their, their instrumentalists do some crazy things quarterly. So well, I mean, a lot of, a lot of gospel, like at least I understand it. Like the things I always press about gospel is just how, you know, like one of my favorite things that when it comes to any kind of gospel music is just the, I, I like to call it like like the the wall of sound, the sea of sound, because you typically have. Uh, I, I remember at one point in church, uh, one of the the per- people leading the uh, the music portion of it, had made a comment of that, like everybody in church sounds beautiful, no matter how bad you're, you oh. think your singing sounds, because it's just like mixture of everybody. And at one point, he just said, I'm, at "One of these times when you guys are singing the the hymn or whatever, I'm going to stop the band, and you guys are just going to sing a cappella." And they did it. It was kind of scary, but it's just like you hear this. Like, I sound terrible, but amongst these this sea of people, I, it's it's just like this beautiful, like everybody's in tune, everybody's chorus. So I, I always like gospel because it takes advantage of that sort of musical fact. Yeah, absolutely. It's really incredible how that works. And then when you have it where everybody can sing their, yep. their tails off, it's it's pretty wild. Um, but those are the two main influences, man. Um, and I can tell you a lot of stories about both, but um, when I was 11 years old, so fifth grade, so when I was 10 years old, everybody played recorders, <laughs> and that was terrible. <laughs> I'm so sorry that my, I made my parents go through that concert because I heard kids play a recorder, and I just wanted to die. <laughs> <laughs> well, because the recorder, so, for like, those who I don't like, know, God, I was like, God, I put my parents through this. Well, because the recorder is, is out, of, out of all... A, go for it. Uh, no. I was gonna say, out of all the wind instruments, the the the, um, the recorder always seems like the lowest of low. Like it's it's like this weird plastic flute type thing. Like it's a level. It's like you're not good enough for the clarinet kid, but we're not gonna just give you a kazoo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a kazoo might be better because at least kazoo is kind of cool. The recorder is just boo boo. <laughs> like somebody made that it's like yo this is trash bro why did you do this to america or wherever it was invented you know because <laughs> well, it's just it's but, like every kid had like it's funny you bring up the recorder because like everybody i'm like i i, I uh, it, once you move, move to high school or middle school it's like all right you're done with the recorder kid here's a real instrument here's here's a clarinet here's a flute here's a sack here's a trumpet whatever if you're gonna play an instrument this here's a piano because there's like there's, you play piano you don't have to play like a recorder is just this like plastic thing like like now i think <laughs> like kids are spoiled now that they have the ability to play something like an ocarina and they and they can like at least feel like they're part of like legend of zelda and things like that like they don't have to deal with playing just shitty recorder music yeah but yeah, okay. it's, it's a good continue though it's ridiculous man but so what happened was i decided to do band and um at the end of fifth grade, our band director played all the instruments for us to, you know, show us what they sounded like. And uh, the trombone sounded like fart noises. Um, so I picked it. That's really how <laughs> that is, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop, 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 stop. Uh, okay, so Kadesh Flow, uh, not just known for his hip-hop music, but known for his, his, his smooth trombone work, his, his amazing stuff. If you've ever seen him perform live, you know. And if you haven't, you should. All of that, everything <laughs> we know, Ryan, that is Kadesh, was all based on the fact that you heard it like, 
That that sounds like someone's farted. I have to play the instrument. <laughs> I swear, man. That's why I started playing. <laughs> That is amazing. That is – okay, so I, I guess that's the question then. What would have happened if you heard like a, like a sax and you're like, that sounds like – like was it like like all of it was like the fart noise? Okay, obviously the <laughs> fart noise is what got you into it. I'm, I'm just now con- – I'm now concerned of like what kept you into it then? Was it just like it kept sounding like a fart? Was it like the fart progressed into melodies? Is there so, – like how did you go from like – to like <laughs> – <laughs> so uh that's a funny question too it's sorry it's a so, no uh, no for those who but, do, for those who do not know at all uh ryan is like he said he's there literally just got done with a gig literally outside the stadium this is as close as you're going to get to having me do like if ever i was on site this is sort of what it sounds like except i'm in studio so hey uh <laughs> video listeners you're in for you're in for a treat because you're just seeing this giant head of ryan uh audio listeners you actually have it better this week <laughs> Compared to all, all that. Uh, but continue, though, Ryan. So it, it stopped. Um, I got past the, the fart noise part. Um, what happened? Okay, so, you know, given the musical background and musical history, can you still hear me okay, by the way? Yeah, yeah, it's funny. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do the following uh, for, for your sake. I'm actually going to kill video for the sake of, of just making it a little bit uh, easier on you because it's just it's it's funny looking at it now. Uh, actually, we do be fair on your phone. Hit the the video off button just so you, it, it's easier. Because honestly, this is not like the most flattering shot of you, and I'd rather have <laughs> have. I, I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna be I'm gonna be conscientious podcaster and say you know what maybe maybe for the best we don't need to see the the ear of Ryan John <laughs> Ryan Davis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, man. No, 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 no. Now you can put up your ear. Now you can do this. It's a lot comfortable. Anyways, uh, I can hear you the fine. But anyways, you're saying, um, you, you obviously fart noises got you into it. Um, you, you kept going. How did you then keep going beyond that? Because obviously it's like, oh, it's kitschy. But then when did it start becoming this? Oh, I can actually do something interesting with this. So what happened was I, I started, I guess, with the musical background. I don't know actually how this really happened. Um, so two, this is a two part answer. So what happened? first was like two weeks after i started band in middle school i was on the back of the bus okay. and we were joking just mad cracking on each other right and um we had a parody for destiny's child say my name which was hot at the time or hot the year before or something like that right and instead of say my name say my name it was close your mouth close your mouth your breath smell like onions <laughs> that were onions either close your mouth so, uh, <laughs> oh my God! Uh, can we? Uh, can we? Uh, let, let's um, let's see how much is a let's see how much is a, a, a mechanical license call cost on, on the say my name beat. We gotta For make that, this real. Probably a lot. <laughs> we gotta figure out how much. We gotta make this real. All right, but anyways, continue with your with your close your mouth Funyuns rant. So. <laughs> So they were asking me, they asked me to make a rap for the, to go with the song. And I was like, I don't really rap, but I used to kind of be freestyling. Like everybody would freestyle back of the bus at the table in the schoolyard or whatever. So I wrote a little rap and it was pretty trash, but it was the first rap I did. And I was like, yo, this was not bad for my first rap that I wrote. Folks were like, yo, you should actually try to do that. So then I started writing songs because my dad found out I was rapping and he got me like CDs of just classic hip hop instrumentals, like from Dr. Dre to Lil Wayne to like Rakim, um, to like you know, like uh, like you know, I'd say 15 years of big hip hop beats, just the beats, and I would write songs to them. And so I entered this uh, youth group, youth competition at this church in Georgia, and uh, it was my first time performing. And I actually got tired by the third verse because I didn't have any breath control, but that encouraged me to keep pursuing. I started listening to music a lot more. And then what happened with that, and this was around, I think eighth grade or seventh or eighth grade, I think. Um, So I had been rapping and playing trombone for about a year at this point. I started hearing melodies in my head, two songs that I really felt like that. I really, you know, that really moved me and those melodies didn't exist. So I got really frustrated um, that I couldn't, uh, that I couldn't, produce those melodies in my head so i started looking at jazz stuff and somebody encouraged me to just play what was in my head along with the songs but that i needed to be good at my scales to do that so i got i at this point i was already really good 
for a middle schooler because I can't stand if I'm committed to something, I can't stand for anybody to be better than me at it. <laughs> um, and that uh, competitive streak combined with my desire to be able to produce what was in my mind musically really is what got me to stay with the trombone, uh, quit football in high school because the rest of my family chose football over band and, so, and some of them are in the NFL now. Um, oh, wow. I, uh, I got like my family like spits out college football talent. People think I play football now. <laughs> um, and, and they're like, no, I, I, I make music. What? I'm sorry. Yeah. You, you, you don't like, why aren't you, why aren't you on the feet? Like, I'm um, look, I, I have this, it's, it's also useful too. No, but that's really cool. The idea of, of that, you hit a point where you wanted, where it was like, there's just no beats here. There's nothing here. There's not, I want to have this, but no one has made, made this yet. Why don't I just make it? And I like that idea of like, that's the beginning of, of where you went to do this. When did it start going, you know, converting that to then recording it and start actually producing it and sort of making it into something more than hey. sort of this, this thing? Um. Oh, shoot. We're, we're... Um, I, I, uh, let's see what, so that first round of songs I recorded, I was writing a lot of songs and, um, and, uh, how did this go? Yeah. My dad got me some studio time with a local engineer in Albany, Georgia, a sound engineer who made beats and I put together a little EP. And at this point, you know, I was like a purely Christian rapper, totally gospel. Um, and I recorded this stuff and it was like, it's, you know, it was pretty good. One of the songs I'm going to like repurpose and redo. Cause it was, it's a really good song. Um, the other words are really, I think kind of naive and very overly preachy, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but this one song is really dope. And, um, and that guy sent it to, I don't know if you know who Creflo Dollar is, but he's like a, a mega church pastor. He's been in the news a lot for a lot of controversial things where like, he asked his church to put in an offering to like buy him a jet and all this stuff. Damn. But, um, okay. <laughs> that's a, but, it's a bit of a, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how the Lord, I, I, if, I, if I remember correctly, there's a couple of verses in the Bible about, you know, maybe not asking for a whole lot of material things, but I mean, I, I guess look, <laughs> you need a jet, you need a jet. Um, sorry, <laughs> but anyways, continue. Yeah. So he's, he's been in the news a little bit, but at that time, he had started a, a Christian hip hop label, label, and um, and somebody from the label uh, heard the stuff, and they wanted to like meet with me, um, but we never set that up because I had to go back home to Alabama and do school. So we just kind of left that there, and it kind of just fell out, and we never tried to pursue it again, which I'm kind of glad didn't happen. But um, that's really where I started recording, and then. A lot of stuff, a lot of like stuff happened where uh, um, a lot of like almost in high school, and um, when I just when I I ended up landing a full ride to school, and I ended up choosing Alabama over Georgia Tech, and if I had chosen Georgia Tech, I probably would have a whole different life now because I would have been in the middle of the Atlanta scene, and I don't know if I was really mature enough for that, so I'm kind of glad it didn't happen, but um, but. Uh, when I went to Bama, they had like, you know, student studios and stuff that were free. And I just really started trying to hold my craft as a student during my time in school, majoring in media, media production. And then after that, getting my master's in business admin. And that's really like, it really just grew because I became really passionate about how uh, lyrics affected people and how the things that I said really like mattered to people who are actually paying attention to what I said. So that's really kind of how it flipped in the recording. Um, the final step in that process that really caused me to merge the two, rap and trombone, is um, I really didn't perform over beats for a long time after high school, because in, in college I started a band with a bunch of jazz band buddies, and so I was rapping over a live band with horns, and that's how we did shows, and we started doing shows everywhere you know around the state and then tuscaloosa and fraternity things and um playing and rapping and having that together i kind of fell in love with it in college that's wow that's actually a lot more in depth than i thought it would be because usually when it comes people they just kind of do it but i like the idea i it's interesting to hear that 
you knew, like knowing, looking looking back now and seeing, had you gone another way, it might be different where you ended up. Um, but because you not only did you a go to a different college, but you're like also studying all your other things. Like I, I think having, like I think you have an advantage in a lot of stuff because you have the business administration side of things that you actually understand the business of music, which is something I think a lot of musicians sometimes lack, especially at an early get go. Yeah. You know, because that's sort of where we always hear the horror stories of somebody getting caught up in that. But having just that sort of in the back pocket that, you know, you have not just the musical talent, not just the production, not just the instruments, but also that business acumen that a lot of that only so many artists truly have. Um, but we need to flash back even further because I, I obviously, uh, for those who do not know Kadesh Flo in any capacity, uh, he is what's known as a nerdcore hip hop artist. And that's sort of a generic term because hip hop's hip hop. It doesn't matter if it's nerdcore or whatever, it's just nerdcore is the. The genre or the 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 taxonomy we give it, if you want to kind of be uh, legit about it, um, but because of that there's a lot of whole, whole bunch of geeky sort of nerdy references. So I guess I got to ask, what is your earliest geek memory? Because obviously we had music as a background, we had hip hop as a background, we had recording, we had gospel, we had all these sort of things. But somewhere in the mix, there's always a little bit of geekiness. Um, what was the question? Sir? Okay, sorry, <laughs> it's, it's all right. Uh, the question was uh, obviously, in in terms of of your of your background, we've had gospel, we have music, whatever. But nerdcore is known for its geeky side of things. So I guess my question is like, what is your earliest geek memory? Like, how the hell did you, especially when it came to you know, hearing all the hip hop you heard, hearing your father gave you like a lot of, uh, you know, old school hip hop, and knowing some of those influences are not always things like Dragon Ball or or video games and whatnot. I'm just always curious as to how how everyone gets into their geeky kind of side. Like, what was their first introduction? And I'm curious what yours is. <laughs> so I, I've always been a gamer. Um, a guy who was a friend of my grandmother's brought me a Sega Genesis without, for, my, uh, for my fifth or sixth birthday. And I had Sonic the Hedgehog, I think Street Fighter 2, and um, Columns. Which yep. was like a, uh, well, I'm not gonna diss columns. Like no that. columns. As as far as match three games go, it's not bad. There are far better match three games. There are far yep. better puzzle games and columns for sure. It's not horrible. It's just not great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I had a Sega Genesis, and um, that really started it. And I went out, and then I think the next thing I got was a PlayStation um, One. And I, I fell in love with a lot of games, Final Fantasy VII, Legend of Dragoon, um, uh, Alundra and Alundra II, and then I had, and then Tekken, and then my mom remarried and my stepfather had an N64, and that's when I played Zelda Ocarina of Time. And he actually, I, he had a strategy guide that he bought just in case, and I wanted to just play through the game with the strategy guide, and he was like, no, that's not how this works. So he like literally locked it in a cabinet so I couldn't get to it and made me figure out how to play the game. <laughs> uh, and so that was my introduction into like actually having to solve puzzles for real and stuff. Um, so it was mostly video games. My first anime introduction, like, I, I mean, I, before I say that, I was really into Scooby-Doo. There was a point in my life where I used to draw, um, I used to watch TV and draw all day during the summer. So like I would draw like comic characters. I always made up stories. Um, always you know just kind of kept everything i was always creating even as a response to like geeky stuff since i was probably like six or seven years old so that's always been there um first anime like a lot of people who are in uh i guess my age or a little younger maybe a little older was dragon ball z when tsunami when the tsunami block started uh I remember seeing them and I thought it was like some version of Street Fighter. And I watched it. I was like, yo, this is crazy. And then I got in the Gundam Wing um, and basically the whole Toonami block. And that, the, so that's like, I guess, the gamut, the full gamut of my exposure. And no, that, that, that makes sense. That's usually the, the answer, especially when it comes to anime. Like everyone either A, began in Toonami or B, somehow I had a friend. Like, like I've never met anybody that was like, I found anime by myself. 
Like it's yeah, usually yeah. it's usually a a friend introduced them to it, or B tsunami existed, or something where they flipped on a television and they're like, "What is this?" Like it's always some sort of assistance, especially. But usually, especially anime being that like that. But you mentioned the idea of animation, especially the drawing side. Uh, what got you to stop drawing then, or uh, was it just like you just kind of escaped, or it's just now like your hobby that you kind of do? Because it's kind of interesting that you had. All these like other, you know, I mean, so many creative things from music to to that and then drawing even makes its way in there. It's a, an interesting kind of thing to put in there. Um, I didn't actually stop. I still draw. It was more that I was when I was in school. I, Alabama has a program called New College. It's an interdisciplinary studies program. And it basically allows you to build your own major around your interests. And they take people who who probably would flunk out of college if they didn't do it because it helps them it's more about the journey than like the degree and then it's people who come in and they're like i want to be an f uh i want to be a botanist but i also want to do music but i also am really in the physics and i'm not sure how to make all that work and help them and give those kids a team a team of advisors to put to put together a program and it's really good so I came in wanting to do music, but also wanted to do graphic art and wanted to maybe design characters for video games or do graphic novels. And I just wasn't sure. Um, and I, you know, took some business classes and, and all that stuff. Uh, so I got, you know, I got some graphic design chops. Um, I do, um, I do my own graphic design stuff when I have time. I've gotten rusty because the long, the short answer is, I guess. Um, you just kind of can't do everything at once at a certain point. No. And so when it, when I, I ran away from music three times. And, um, when I was working on the NBA, I really only had time to work on music and get better as a producer and as a lyricist. And I couldn't, I didn't even really have time to get better as a trombonist, but I was already really good. So I, I was, I've been riding off of just the work I did from high school through my junior year of college up until, a month or so ago when I quit my job, which is another conversation. But, um, but yeah, uh, I didn't, so I never actually stopped drawing. I never stopped writing either. I used to write, I, I have a binder full of ideas. And once I get to a point of sustainability musically, um, whenever I can switch gears, I'm going to be writing and maybe illustrating some and get back on that, that, that is, whole game. That is, so I, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm kind of gushing, but that's interesting. Like really cool. Like, only because, like, it, it, you mentioned, like, especially in college, like, the, the course, you got lucky in that because a lot of people don't quite realize that college is really there to give you the tools so that you can learn on your own. Ah. And, and that's been my, my opinion of, of how college was to me was that, it, you know, I, I like I went into college as an as like an MIS guy, like a computer IT kind of person, and then ended up switching to being an English major with an MIS minor or like basically a, an IT minor, if you will, like, a, like databases and weird things like that, because English just uh, interested me more and, and was more of my thing as, as it turns out. But that's a really cool program to be part of, especially just the idea of like, you, we know you're talented. We know you can do something. You just may not know what that is yet because you have all these different interests. And a lot of people, you know, sort of look at those people strangely, whereas I, I look at them as creatives and that's awesome kind of thing. Um, but we should kind of flash forward now because you keep bringing up that you recently quit your job. And, and I, and I, I, I guess what, before we kind of get to all of that, this will probably lead into it because, um, as we said at the very top of the show, uh, Ryan is much like myself and much like a lot of people you've heard on the show prior is part of what's called the NPC collective, the nerdy people of color, uh, for lack of better words, it's a collection of like-minded individuals who are all creative in some capacity doing creative things, helping each other and things like that. I guess my question is going to be, how did you get word of all the things that are the NPC? Like, how did you get into that mix of people, especially when it comes to like meeting uh, Mega Ran, uh, Kyle and, and, and such and such, such. So that's a really, uh, uh, thanks for saying all that too. Like, that's really cool um, <laughs> that you could connect to it that way. <laughs> well, cause I'm, uh, I, I was telling Kyle this, I'm like, I don't, rhyme i don't rap i love you i love rap and stuff like that now in nerdcore but i have i have no desire to be a musician but i am creative and i do this interview thing called a podcast and i go well i'm part of the npc now somehow uh, where do where do i fit in this this weird collective of musicians when it's just like me being 
Like, I'm not a groupie. I'm like, I'm beyond groupie because I'm a friend now. But I'm just like, it's like, where do I fit in this mix? Because it's it's that joke I make to myself. It was like, I'm the support <laughs> character, I guess. And stuff like that. And so anyways, but continue, though. Yeah, man. So the story of me getting involved with the MPCC is really, really kind of cool to me and funny. So I was, at this point, I'm... I'm around, uh, I think a junior in college. I'm 20 years old. The junior, the year three in any process for me, by the way, fun nugget about Dash. Speaking of, of myself in third person. Funny, <laughs> funny <note. laughs> do, do you, funny, typi- funny do you typically of- speak about yourself in third person? Are we going to have a no. Mr. T? Is, is, are we going to have a Mr. T moment? Is it is this gonna be your is it gonna be your Bo Jackson moment of time? I'm sorry, that's those are the only two people I know off the top of my head that speak in the any rock. capacity of third. The Rock speaks in third person and whatnot. Uh, anyways, right, continue. You, I I was 20 years old. It was during my junior year, and year three. The nugget, the interesting thing about me is year three in any process has always been kind of like the breakout year. Uh, from middle school, eighth grade was really big for me. My junior year of high school was really big. My junior year of college was really big. And then my third year in Kansas City was really where I started to really to really move, which was last year. And it was also where I started to do a lot of things around the country. So this is year three of co- of undergrad. Um, and I'm already I have a band. I'm doing shows around the city. I'm starting to become known. I have a really dope internship. I'm working on a music festival that uh, my fellow interns and I are, are organizing that we're co-founding and and another group of interns in the same internship had an idea to do a video game convention at, at the University of Alabama. And they wanted to have a concert of video game music. And lo and behold, I had been writing all these video game bars and anime bars and just hadn't wanted to, to put them out because I thought people would think that was kind of lame. And then I, I saw this album called Black Materia from some guy named Mega Ran, and it was like awesome. And um, this this wasn't uh, I don't think actually I don't think it was Black Materia. I think it was Forever Famicom that I saw from Rand my junior year. And then I and then I followed him and I saw Black Materia because I think that was the year later in 2011. But anyway, so uh, I was inspired between that and doing the, the video game music for the con to do some some songs, some of my songs live. And that's really where it's, where I started doing nerdy hip hop bars and then after that um i was in my first year fast forward a year and a half two years was in my first year of grad school and i had put a couple things on youtube but didn't really try to do anything for real skyrim was about to come out and i was like you know what i'm gonna do a skyrim rap i haven't done like you know i haven't done anything on youtube i'll take it seriously i had maybe like three uploads and i put this skyrim rap together and I hadn't really put anything on YouTube, and it was really getting some good traction, especially for something that's that niche. Um, so it was like, you know, I, I was getting like 10,000 views a week for a couple of weeks, and then it tapered off because I got posted on a bunch of stuff. So I was like, okay, well, this is interesting that it's doing this well. Let me do another thing. So I did a Star Wars rap for Star Wars The Old Republic. Around this time, Richie Branson came out with his Cold Republic mixtape, and it, it was like a, um, they, YouTube wasn't doing like the suggested videos thing, but I was looking at Star Wars raps to see who else was doing this. And he was looking at Star Wars raps to see whoever, who else was doing this. <laughs> and we found each other on YouTube and I was like, yo, I, we got a collab. And he messaged me and was like, yo, I was just looking at your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already just and, laughing just cause like those, it's always, it's always those things where you're doing something in one lane the other person is doing it in another lane. You're both doing the same kind of thing. And you're like, well, let me see what the other lane's doing. Oh. And they look back. Oh, you're doing the same. Like, yeah, that's, that's kind of cool, especially when it comes to finding somebody that's in that same niche as you in that same kind of uh, area as you musically. Yeah, it was really cool. It was really awesome. But he was the first person I, I really met who was really dope from that scene um, that I actually started interacting with. He shot me a few beats. You know, we would just kind of interact. And he was – he was really moving. He, you know, he came from a much more legit place musically than I did. And he, he started making those moves and doing the Otaku Tuesdays while I was trying to navigate my first year of grad school. And so we kind of were on the same page because I was going to do the same thing he was doing, but I'm not nearly as good of a producer or a sound engineer. And I don't have as much knowledge about marketing. 
So, like, I was going to do a release a track every week sort of thing, but didn't have time to. So um, I would kind of watch him do his thing. And I, on the same time, I also emailed Mega Ran and asked him if he took interns. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> I'm not laughing at, at you. I'm not laughing at you. I'm more laughing just at the idea of like, of you, bright eyed bushy tailed Ryan, who I've seen now, who I've hung out with, and, and and knowing what I know now, just emailing Raheem and saying, "Hey, d- do you take interns? Because I'd love to intern for you, Mega Ran. By the way, my name is Ryan. <laughs> Sorry." Yeah, man, it's hilarious. <laughs> and he forgot about it. Fast forward. Uh, <laughs> Fast forward like five years, and I'm in a hotel room with him before Magfest, before playing like one of the biggest shows I've ever played, thanks to him. And I was like, I don't know if you remember this, but I emailed <laughs> you to ask if you took interns, and he was like, What? <laughs> I'm sorry, in in what intern? Who? Huh? What? <laughs> Wait, you think? Because now that you okay, because that's I, I it, it's so fu- funny, and I'm not I'm not saying this in a bad way because and and if anyone knows this now, you've you've heard all these guests before. They've all been in the show in some capacity. Um, it's funny knowing how approachable these people are, and how from the outside a lot of people think that there's all these like mechanisms at work, like to the point where you were outside Ryan at the time, yeah. and you're like, hey, surely you have interns. Surely you have this like giant kind of organization where where there are interns there's editors there's sound not not realizing it's like it's him it's kyle and 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 some and some form of like other things you know um but okay so so uh so then let's let's kind of uh get get more uh forward in time because we've kind of got the interesting because obviously you've been mentioning and you've been saying this consistently and i'm i'm really curious now that you recently kind of quit your job to do all things musically. Um, I ask this because always a lot of artists and a lot of creatives kind of have the same kind of mentality of like wanting to, to, you know, work their passion as they say, what got you to leave what people would consider the safety net of a job? Okay. So this is a, a longish answer as well. Cause everything for me is like layered. No, no, the, the, layered, I would, I would honestly path. expect nothing less than it to be long, especially cause it's, it's one of those decisions when you talk to like, cause when you talk to real people, you know, people who have jobs, people who have that, you know, and, and other things, it's not just simply like, where do you get the money? It's like, okay, where are you getting the money to live? What about uh, health insurance? All these sort of things that, that people kind of take for granted when they have a job. And, and that when you when you take that plunge into doing it on your own, and especially when you have, and it's not to say that music can't give you a consistent level of income, but it can be variable, like any freelance job can. Um, and and so a lot of people are always like, but how do you deal with with that? How do you you know how do you plan for the uncertainty? Because a lot of people don't like uncertainty, and so even but even you making that choice, there is a point of like, well. I think I can do this because even then you're, you know, you're sometimes trepidatious. So I'm curious just how, how you overcame all that. But yeah, but go on your story though. Continue. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That's a really, it's a really good question too. So around the time that I really started doing nerdy, bringing nerdy bars into my music, um, it kind of was adjacent. So I landed an internship at the Cannes Film Festival in France and like when I say my junior year of college was my breakout year, it, a lot happened. I co-founded a music festival that was um, that was really um, it was really a really big moment for me, um, and the, it's it still exists. The city still has it, you know. Uh, the, and a bunch of stuff happened. I had dinner with Neil Gaiman because he was a guest at the university, and and I was one of the people selected to have dinner with him, and he gave me advice about storytelling and music and like applying storytelling and music to my comic world stuff. I mean, to, to I'm not, la- I'm not laughing at you. I'm stuff. just laughing at, at, at the idea that like you, your junior year, you're talking to one of the legends of, of fantasy writing of comic book writing of, of just writing in general. And he's, and, and you're getting advice from this man. Yeah. That is insane. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty unreal, dude. And then, um, and then, so, so I'll, I'm saying all this is like a lot of stuff happened that told me, hey, I could maybe actually do this stuff because I had at that point kind of decided that I didn't want to do music. There's that quote: "If you're creative and good at being creative, but you're good at anything else, you should do the other thing." 
You know, I was like kind of along those lines. But then I got the internship at the Cannes Film Festival and I'm over there literally partying with celebrities. And as an intern, I was I would get invited to parties I'm on red carpet screenings. And there was a guy um, who worked on, I think, uh, I think he worked on Blue Valentine, the Ryan Gosling and Michelle Williams movie. Um, but he was one of the, he wasn't, he's not like a, a big known name, I don't think. But there were, I, they'd have these round table discussions and the lady, no, it wasn't a guy. It was a lady. There was a lady who, um, I forget her name, but she like, she was the uh, associate producer for Blue Valentine and she did Half Nelson. Um, I can't think of her name, but she had this little round table chat with the interns and only like four people showed up. So I just straight up asked her a bunch of questions. And one of the things that I talked about with her and then with another producer whose name I also don't remember um, about the music industry is, is, both of them, even though they weren't experts in the music industry, they have, you know, those industries are kind of adjacent. They had a lot of friends in it. They were like, you really shouldn't. I was at this time, I was thinking maybe I would leave. I would graduate and move to L.A., move to New York immediately and try to get a record deal. And they were like, you know, you shouldn't do that right now because there's this thing called 360 deals. It's kind of new, but you don't own anything. And unless you are a superstar with huge numbers, you will never own anything. And I was like, well, that's interesting. So I guess I'll figure out the independent route. Um, so that was the first thing. It was like all this stuff like, hey, maybe I could do this. That was like, OK, well, I should stay in school. Maybe I should think about a grad school. Maybe, you know, later I would decide to do the MBA thing. Um, so I was deciding against pursuing a record deal. Right. Um, so you fast forward to. Grad school, the summer after my first year, I had some free time. I would release a track every week. I, I would go on to release a track every week for six months just off of requests that people put in the comments, like, can you rap about this anime? That became like four 10-track mixtapes. Um, I graduate grad school. I moved to Kansas City, ironically getting a job in Kansas City because one of the guys I also was studying in independent hip-hop was Tech 9 who I would later like get to know a little bit and get to know Chris Calico and get to know a lot of guys in strange music and a lot of guy and get to know Mac lethal. Um, and, um, coming to Kansas city after all of that, that I just said, and then realizing that those guys are really accessible and Kansas city is a very accessible city as far as the people who are, who have done big things in it. Um, and just being able to, catch game from these guys and the guys that work with them and watch what they do and how they move um within like six months of being in kansas city i had a conversation with tech nine's business partner travis um where i just straight up i was like yo i'm not trying to get signed by you i just have questions about how to get going because i'm about to start booking shows seriously i just finished grad school i've got a financial bed um and i want to really get this thing moving and he just straight up uh, chop, 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 you know, step by step was like, this is what you need to think about doing. And uh, I finished a free album called Gateways. It's probably my most popular project. A few months after that, I released it. I started booking shows seriously. And everything, like my mindset starting in grad school was I was like, okay, I'm going to wake up when I'm, I realized in grad school that I'm going to wake up as a 40 year old vice president with approaching teenage kids or something like that and married and freak my family out because I never actually try to do this thing that I clearly have a buzz doing both locally and on the internet. I don't know why I wouldn't eventually put together a path to where eventually that is what I'm doing wholeheartedly. So here in Kansas city, I was afraid to play trombone with my raps, but I was playing trombone with all these jazz cats. Kansas City has a rich jazz history. There are instrumentalists I play with who are literally in the studio with legends on a regular basis, tour with legends on a regular basis. Um, and so I'm catching game from those guys, and those guys thought I was dope. And so then the seed gets planted further where it's like, yo, these really legit people think I'm really legit. Um, okay, so then... I start getting asked to play with other rappers and in bands and I'm already starting to book shows around the country. By this point, Rand has asked me to join a collective. He started called the Nerdy People of Color Collective with Richie, with Samus, who I had come to really respect, with 1UP, with IQ, with Subzilla and everybody. Um, and uh, all that stuff kind of was a perfect storm to say, okay, well, in a couple years, maybe I'll be able to leave my job. 
the final straw with that was I got a job with a, a financial tech startup called C2FO that really is making a lot of global news. It's kind of changing the game financial tech wise. Um, and I worked with the most brilliant people I've ever worked with at this company, but they, it was a startup. So it's like, you're working your tail off while you're at work, but they have unlimited vacation. And I know this is a lot, uh, but the unlimited vacation thing, even though I still tried to keep it under four weeks, that allowed me to take, you know, I, I was getting hired. And I was like, yo, I'm, I'm playing on an official show at South by Southwest. And I didn't expect to get hired at this job. I already committed to it. And I need to go. And they were like, you're playing an official show at South by Southwest. This is like the chief sales officer for the company. He was like, dude, take the whole week off. What are you talking about? Go. What? Yeah, no. I, I, I think that's that's the, especially when it comes to startup mentality and startups in that because of what South by not just in music, not just in film, but also interactive represents. They understand like, oh, you're playing a showcase show. You're officially, yeah. You take the week off. You're totally cool. Do you, could you? Do you need a badge? Do you want to network with anybody while you're there? You know those. You know, do you need business cards for our company? Because we may need you know those contacts and things like that. Especially yeah. when it comes to that kind of industry, and that that's awesome. Yeah, man, and that was really big because that that flexibility allowed me. I booked. I shouldn't have. In theory, I would, shouldn't have done this because uh, you should tour with an established artist first. But I wanted to go ahead and crash course myself, so I booked two mini tours uh, called the Day Jobs Tours. One on the West Coast, I lost $800. One on the East Coast, I made like $150. So, like, not big losses, not a big loss, pretty minimal gain, but really got good network in there. At this point, I'm starting to really meet and party with people who produce shows I, I watched as an adolescent and, like, you know, really start to connect with people and learn. And this, all this stuff, so all this stuff is telling me, hey, you are going to do this. So the final straw with C2FO, the flexibility, et, et cetera, was um, playing trombone with all these people. I'm starting to open for people who are huge and all this crazy stuff. And see, the company was really ramping up because so much, there's so many wins, closing so many huge deals with enormous global, like Fortune 50 companies. And since it's ramping up, you know, 100% year over year growth uh, every month was 100% over or more the metrics of the pre the month that month the previous year. So everybody's working a lot, and at the same time, I'm working a lot on working on an album and playing these shows and booking shows. Uh, I just hit a wall honestly because I was working like 16 hour days for about a year straight, and between between the two. And and uh, I was planning on leaving in March of 2018. I started kind of sucking at everything. My manager talked to me about it. He was like, hey, man, you know, I know what you're trying to do. We got to figure out how to get your performance back up. But I know you I know you're eventually going to be doing this like straight up, like totally supportive. And um, after that conversation, I, I decided to go ahead and, and leave. And um, I'm freelancing, you know, maybe like five, 10 hours a week for the company I just left. And uh, so I have a little, and then I have a little bit of air cover monetarily. And um, yeah, that, that basically is what happened. So to, to recap, it was no figuring out that eventually I was going to do this and then having everything accelerate so much. Once I put it out there, you know, people say that God will meet you halfway or they say like the universe will meet you halfway or whatever, you know, people believe, um, but that uh, I'm a I'm a I'm still a living testament of that. Uh, I started putting myself out there, and it really started happening. And now I'm putting myself out there to the utmost level, and kind of trying to see what happens. No, that makes sense. I mean, especially I mean, and and you mentioned your manager, and I always think a good manager knows when he has somebody that's destined for things greater than their current job, and that even yeah. though that person will do the best they can in the job that they have, that they're destined for something bigger. Um, and that's actually a really good, like you lucked out finding a manager like that, especially one that's like, yeah, you're meant for something else. And we know you're meant for something else, uh, but you're doing your job. Well, let's see if we can figure out a way where both can kind of work. And if they don't, then that's, that's life and everything else. But that's, that's interesting that it's that way that sort of things just, you know, you, you, you would look at yourself in the mirror and said, I, I know this is something I need to do. And then you did it. And then everything kind of worked out. I'm not saying it's it's not you know it's still an ongoing process, and you're just beginning it, as you mentioned. 
but I like that that's where your leap began was the idea of just seeing all these other people and kind of getting introduced to the indie music scene. So we're almost out of time. We've actually, surprisingly enough, hit the hour mark, even though we had said this was a quick one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, hey, that's, that's, that's a, it's a good sign. So I guess i got to ask, as a last question, Ryan, especially because, you know, we, we, we've got uh, – you just got done doing literally a show tonight, um, and there are <laughs> plenty – you know, we got MAGFest on, on – we got so many things on the horizon. What's next for Kadesh? Like, what's coming out? What's, what's, what are things to come, as they say? Um, so I am, I guess the immediate next thing, the immediate next thing, this next week is actually really insane for me because I have my first headlining set at the riot room, which is like the, um, the like smaller scale local music venue in Kansas city that books everything. Like if to put it in perspective, they, Elijah Wood has played there, a DJ there, Rakim, um, Rakim's playing there in a couple weeks. And it's like the venue, they do a lot of local shows, but they book extremely well. So that, that's really cool. That's, that's Tuesday. And to have a headlining set there really means a lot to me, especially because I don't really try to do a lot of rap sets in Kansas City. Immediately after that, I'm flying to Seattle for PAX. I'm joining Rand on his PAX showcase set, and then, um, which he's the official artist for. You know, I'm just kind of guessing on the stuff that I'm featured on. And then, and then I'm doing the after party for uh, doing the after party for uh, well the PAX after party at Funhouse with Samus and Shubs and a lot of MPC Collective family, also Adam Celine, a bunch of really great homies. So that's show wise, that's happening. That's really that's really crazy to me. But uh, I'm working on I've been working on an album for about two years that was the result of really a very personal journey for me. And I wrote it, I started writing it the summer, the day before my birthday in 2016. And I finished writing it the day of my birthday in 20 or the day before my birthday in 2015 and finished writing it the day of my birthday in 2017. I'm about to break some of that up. Some of it that doesn't fit the narrative of the album and release an EP towards the end of the year. That's going to be called Otaku Moods. And then I've got a project, a full length album that'll be coming out in the late spring of 2018 called The Last Excuse. That's really about my, uh, really talks lyrically about this journey of taking music seriously, uh, combined with um, kind of the emotional and relationship journeys I had, because there's a lot of relationship stuff. And um, it's all, it's like very personal, but that's happening. Um, and those are those are really the next things that are coming up besides a bunch of shows <laughs> <laughs> besides all the other things that 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 could happen and and are happening god i'm 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 always jealous that you guys get to play pax only cuz like that's the, like there are conventions i need to go to and and pax is on the list specifically pax prime but usually by the time i want to go like my like my only shot is that one day i'll have the panel to pitch to pax that'll like you know get me there because i'll never buy a badge in time because i'll get sold out in time but that doesn't matter right now ryan thank you so much for being on the show let's say people want to actually have heard this love your story love all these things like that aren't super familiar with your music quite yet how can they get familiar with not only a your music but more importantly b how can they buy all your music my friend well first of all roberto thanks so much for having me on this podcast uh I, I know I know it's been a little crazy. No, I thought we please, were playing look, a little early. The, the one thing I've learned as a podcaster that I, I imagine artists learn, but me importantly I've learned is one, you always have to be flexible, and B, you always have to be ready to just get going and move. Uh, and that's sort of been my like MO when it's like, hey, can I switch the time to this? this? Sure, I may have things planned, but forget it. I've got to cycle and, and, and adapt because that's the only – that's the only ability I have in this game is, is one a to keep a conversation going, but more importantly, B to be able to roll with the punches and, and adapt as things change very quickly. So don't even. Yeah. Worry. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. Um, but to find me, they would have just go to Kadesh flow.com. W dot Kadesh flow. K a D E S H F L O W.com. 
or Google me at Kadeshflow.com. Or, or, I'm saying, sorry, Google me at Kadeshflow. <laughs> <laughs> or Google, on either, either go to Kadeshflow.com or Google Kadeshflow.com. One of those will eventually get to the website you need to get to. That'll One of them it. will. <laughs> but it's Kadeshflow everything uh, on all social media platforms that you can think about. Just Kadeshflow. You'll find me. It's very easy to find. I'm the first, like, two pages of Google search results. And on Kadeshflow.com, you'll be able to find some of my music you can stream. You can also find some merchandise that I have that you can get online if you want to get a shirt or a physical copy of a CD or anything along those lines. So just just get at me that way and, and hit me up. Yeah, and, and just to, as to reiterate, music's everywhere from, from Bandcamp, which is my preferred way of buying music, but it's also on iTunes, Spotify, even YouTube. Yep. So anywhere you can listen to music, chances are you'll be able to find Kadesh Flow. Of course, you can find me. I'm at Vincent404, then the Twitters and the Internet. And if you want to catch previous episodes of the podcast, you can go to our website, cosmicradio.tv forward slash 8BitLife. There you find links to the show notes, the Twitter account for the show, which is at 8 Life Podcast. And after you've bought all the awesome music from Kadesh Flow and you've listened to everything from Church, his collaboration with Rand, to anything else he's done, including things off of my personal favorite album, Hero Music Volume 2, Head over to patreon.com forward slash 8bitlife and help the show become bigger, better, and more awesomer. So that is it for today. So until next time, talk to another geek about something completely and utterly random. Bye, people. <laughs>